Good morning. Today is Friday, October 4th, 2008. My name is Mark DePew. I'm the Director of Oral History at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library. And today it's our distinct pleasure to talk to Dr. Edward Runge. Ed, welcome. Thank you. Good to be here, Mark. Uh, this is part of our Agriculture in Illinois project that we're doing with the Illinois State Museum as well. Uh, one of 50 video interviews we're doing. And unlike most of these, I thought it might be appropriate to kind of set the stage a little bit or put this in some kind of a, a time and place, if you will, with what's going on in the United States. Dr. Runge is a trained agronomist. I've spent your entire life doing that. I know that your specialty area is soil science, and uh, for a person on the outside, he says, oh my, this might be kind of boring, but I know <laughs> this is going to be a fascinating discussion. And you have been at the heart of a lot of the things that are in the news right now. Of course, at this point in time, we're about two weeks away from a presidential election. Things like ethanol production are very much in the news and in the public dialogue right now. And you've been at the heart of that discussion for many, many years. So that's part of why we're fascinated to talk to you. Uh, then you get into the subject of commodity prices and why corn goes from $2 to $7 back to $4. And you've been at the heart of a lot of that discussion as well. So I think this is about as relevant as you can get in terms of the subject that we're going to talk about. Okay. We always like to start with uh, your childhood and growing up, and I know that you grew up on a farm in Illinois, so let's start with this. When and where were you born? I was born in St. Peter, Illinois, in Fayette County, on a little farm. I think we farmed about 160 acres, as I remembered it, and we had uh, everything. We had milk cows, we had pigs, we had chickens, we grew oats and wheat and corn and we made silage and uh, all those sorts of things. So uh, we had a lot of work to do. Describe the soil and the climatic conditions in that part of Illinois. Well, Fayette County is what they call the gray area, so the gray soils of Illinois. So it's south of the Shelbyville Moraine and the Shelbyville Moraine marks the terminus of the darker soils. And so here in Sangamon County you have the deeper lust soils and they're dark as well. Uh, so uh, uh, this area was lower in fertility than this particular area would be for the more northern parts of Illinois. And tell us a little bit about your parents. Well, my parents were born in the late eight, 19, 1898 and 1899, so they passed on, but uh, they farmed all their life. And their names? Ed and Bertha Runge. And uh, my mother was a grant. She had nine brothers and sisters besides yourself. So it was a large family. And my father was uh, sort of the youngest of his. All of his, all my aunts and uncles on my father's side were like grandma and grandpa because dad was, his oldest sister was old enough to be his mother. So my cousins on my dad's side were more like uncles than they were like cousins. So, so how, we, we had a lot of cousins. How far back can you trace your family and that piece of land? I think it goes back to about 1870. Uh, I think it was purchased a little later than that. Uh, but we have a centennial farm and uh, we've had that for more than 10 years. So we probably had the farm in our name since about the 1880s, if I remember correctly, from the abstract. But I haven't looked at it in a long time. Okay. And you say you were born in 1933, so a child of the Depression. Yep, I was born in the bottom of it, I guess you would say. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, uh, my father bought the farm that we were on probably in the later 20s. So uh, I don't know whether he paid much for it, but uh, any kind of money was scarce in my growing up periods, particularly through the end of World War II. Uh, things perked up a little bit in World War II because there was more demand for agricultural commodities. But really, I think I remember $4 beans sometime in the late 40s. And uh, that was a, a big change over what they had been. Uh, so that was, uh, that was uh, a, a thing I remember. I think it was in the late 40s. Do you recall much about the, you know, those later years of the 1930s? It was still very hard times on the farm. Do you recall much about those years? Well, uh, you know, I guess everybody was poor, and we didn't know we were poor. But we never had a problem. We, essentially, we were self-sufficient. Now, we had to get them buy overalls and clothes and 
uh, salt and pepper and sugar and things like this. But we canned everything we grew. We had big gardens. And, uh, How big so, a garden do you think you had? Uh, it probably was about a half acre. So, uh, you know, one of our punishments, if you didn't get along right with mom and dad and the, your siblings, well, you could always weed the strawberry patch. <laughs> So weeding the strawberry patch was a place was kind of like go sitting in the corner. <laughs> but with a very practical end in sight. Yeah, we never were short of strawberries. <laughs> Did you have chores every morning you were expected oh, yeah. to do? Well, I don't know when we started with our chores, but uh, essentially the routine started at 5 in the morning. We got to milk cows. That usually took till about 6, and then we had breakfast. Then we had to do the rest of the chores, the chickens and the pigs and things like this. And then we went off to school. And early we walked to school, so we walked two miles. Uh, uh, if You know, we didn't walk every day, but we walked more than we rode. And there wasn't school buses. Well, I went to a Lutheran school in the town of St. Peter, so uh, there was some problem with public school buses being picked up Lutheran school kids. That has since dissipated, but... Uh, Anyway, I had a good school, a good education in, in grade school in particular. I know uh, back in those days, there were lots of Lutheran churches that still spoke German or other languages. Yeah, we, we had, uh, when I was a kid, we had a German service and an English service every Sunday. Then it went to a German communion service every month. And then I think the pastor that we had changed and a new one didn't speak German, so it really went out of, out of, uh, of uh, you know, we didn't have German church except on very rare occasions. Did your family go to the German service? I think we went to both. Uh, mostly we went to the Luther or to the English service, but uh, uh, I used to could pray in German. I can't anymore. <laughs> Did you speak German at all at home? Uh, a little. Uh, my two older brothers spoke more German than I did. Sort of there was a feeling that the kids were in school were going to speak English. So, And then, see, World War II started, and German kind of fell out of mm -hmm. flavor. So so I remember taking German in grade school till the third grade, and the third grade must have been about when World War II was starting. And uh, anyway, German was dropped. I want you to tell us a little bit more about well, first of all, did your father consider himself to be a subsistence farmer? No, no. He farmed like everybody else. Uh, no, basically we sold wheat. We sold some pigs. Uh, we sold, you know, eggs and milk on a regular basis. So uh, if all else failed, we lived between egg check and milk check. How and many milk cows did you have? Oh, early on, not very many. We probably had about 16 or something like that. We all had to milk about three or four cows of a morning. And uh, later, uh, after I left home, they went into the dairy business. And I think they might have got up to 50, 60 cows. I don't remember the exact number. But when the kids all left, Dad decided he wasn't going to milk the cows. So the cows left in about 59, if I remember right. Did either of your parents work off the farm? No, no, they worked on the farm. Did well, my dad did, you know, he had a barn somebody needs to, you know, put up while everybody went and helped. And, and he was kind of a carpenter, electrician, plumber, more so than most people. So he could do about anything. Mm -hmm. How about the amount of mechanization that you had on the farm growing up? Well, initially we had horses. I think we had six horses. I remember when we had four, but uh, Dad traded two horses in Burton Flory on a uh, 1937 case CC. Bert and Flory? That was the name of the horses, <laughs> yeah. It was a mare and Marilyn. Uh, uh, anyway, there was a pair of horses there. And the other were Dewey and Daisy. So Dewey and Daisy stayed around after we had tractors. Bert and Flory were traded in on the tractor. <laughs> So. And that was during the Second World War, you say? That would have been probably about 1940, would be my guess, 39 maybe. I don't remember exactly the year, but I would say 39 to 40. I would guess then that you were too young to be driving a team of horses in the field. Yes, but I worked with my Uncle Sam, who was quite a bit older than my parents were. 
and uh, he had britchen harnesses. We had uh, the harnesses that went around the tail instead of uh, britchen harnesses were made to back up because they pushed on the you had a back of the horse was a uh, you know it, it pushed on the back mm -hmm. of the horse. So I can still harness horses. Britch. Britchen, I think they B R I T C H I N, I believe. Britchen. Britchen harnesses. They were uh, uh, essentially, if you had hilly uh, landscapes, if you didn't have brakes on your wagons, well, then if you didn't have that kind of harness, why the wagon essentially pushed the collar off the horse, and this way there was a strap that went around their back hips, so to speak, and it kept that so they could brake or hold. Now. Where we were, it was flat, so we didn't have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. Did you have electricity on the farm? I think we got electricity. Uh, they strung the wires in 4041, and they turned the electricity on, if I remember right, in early 42. Now, World War II started in December 41. But the wires were up, and uh, then we got uh, electricity You know, at, at that point. Now, there was electricity on the along the highway in St. Peter, Farina, places like this, but not in a rural countryside. So this was REA, Rural Electrification Association. And that, uh, it was nice to not have to have the old Coleman lantern, which put out a lot of heat, a lot of light, but a lot of heat, or just the old Wick lantern lights, which uh, didn't make much light anyway. Do you remember that first day you got electricity on the farm? Not really. Uh, it, I must have been in about the second, third grade, third grade maybe, uh, something like that. And uh, no, I don't remember the first day, but uh, I'm sure that uh, I did it one time. What are some of the other, not just lights, are there some other things that your family got that were powered by electricity right after that? We got a refrigerator pretty quickly, but you couldn't get much of that stuff until the end of World War II. So you had to, so most of those early buys on le electrical appliances were delayed until the end of World War II. We then had electric stove and refrigerator and once we got a deep freeze, we had a big old international deep freeze, well the canning pr process slowed down considerably, but prior to that everything was canned. You know, canned meat, you can uh, all kinds of vegetables, uh, you can fruit. Uh, you know, I, I told you, I think last night, I don't ever remember us not having peaches or pears or plums or something like that for, uh, you know, to finish our evening meal. And we often had pie and cake and things of that nature. So mom was, she was a busy lady. Well, if you aren't careful, my stomach's going to start to grumble <laughs> over here. Now we just had coffee cake this morning. From a, <laughs> that was that was a Friday dish at our house. Did your family do the own, their own butchering? Oh yes, yeah. And it was a you know this was everybody helped everybody. So uh, butchering you started very early because you had to heat the water. But we butchered hogs, in particular, and then we butcher smaller beef calves. But that was we didn't get into the sharing you know the ring where you butcher a calf and then. You know, you share it with your neighbors because you couldn't eat it fast enough. But we didn't get into that, as I remember. When we did butcher, uh, we often canned meat. And uh, the meat was canned, and you could preserve it then a long time. So uh, it Well, was the hogs were different at that time, too, were they not? Yeah, well, we, we had, uh, you know, salt-cured pork. Uh, we, uh, you had also, we had smokehouses where you smoked the the meat and the ham. Now it went to liquid smoke a little bit mm -hmm. later, but uh, on uh, on the butchering of the hogs, I remember better than the butchering of the cattle, and we didn't butcher that many cattle, but uh, basically the hogs, you'd start the morning probably four <coughs> o'clock, and you tended to want to be finished by mid-afternoon, and you tried to pick a cold day if you could, but one of the things you did is you uh, you made lard, and so you you heated up the the uh, you know the fatty part of the of the pig, and then you ran it through a press and you squeezed the lard out, and we ended up with something we called at the end was cracklings. It was everything. It was still like a deep fried uh, pork rind, I mm -hmm. guess you would say, except I always tasted better because they were warm. 
and uh, so you could eat those till you got sick almost. <laughs> was the lard though important in terms of the preservative as well? No, we lard was our our cooking oil. Okay. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> no, we put lard in in crock pots. Uh, they probably were from three to five gallon in size. Most of them probably in the three gallon size. And I don't remember it's exactly three gallon, but it wasn't as big as five gallon in general. But that was the way that you, uh, you I mean, instead of uh, corn oil, soybean oil, things like this, you <coughs> use lard. Did you use all of the pig? All the pig. Yeah, we make sausage while well, you, <laughs> you clean the intestines and you use those to stuff the sausage. And uh, then, uh, you know, we had some, what we call summer sausage. We'd hang that up. It was, again, preserved, and uh, we had summer sausage. And, uh, well, we made a lot of different kinds of things, liverwurst and blutwurst and these kinds of things. Uh, I'm jumping around here a little bit, but I'm curious in those electrical appliances, do you recall when you got a radio? We had a radio before we had a refrigerator. Uh, we had a battery-powered radio, but, you know, the batteries didn't last very long. Totally. So that was before you even got electricity. Yeah, and they were tube-powered. I mean, uh, they weren't transistorized radios, so they took a lot of power. And so they drained the battery pretty fast. And uh, then we had the first radio was a Crosley radio. I think it was made in Cincinnati. And I distinctly remember listening to the St. Louis Cardinal baseball <laughs> games, <laughs> you know, uh, they were, uh, they were, you know, we could be entertained. We could, uh, you know, the, the announcers were very colorful. You felt you could see the picture while you were there. And actually, I went to the first ball game I went to was a 1944 World Series when the St. Louis Cardinals played the St. Louis Browns, and it was 1944. And I had an uncle that lived probably a mile and a half from the ballpark. It was Sportsman's Park. And so uh, we walked to the ballpark from his place. Well, you got to tell us who won the series that year. That was the Cardinals, if I remember correctly. So uh, anyway, but uh, see, this was the depth of World War II. So they mm. were very stripped of, and the Browns had a one-armed outfielder. I believe his name was Ted Gray. And he also hit. So he'd catch the ball with one hand, and he'd have to tuck the glove under his stub arm and then throw the ball in. And I don't remember which outfield he played, but he had uh, something he called a drag bunt. Uh, anyway, it was, uh, you know, everybody that was very able was in the Army. Mm -hmm. So it was either old people or uh, people that had other problems and couldn't be in the Army. Do you recall when you got a telephone on the farm? Oh, we always had a telephone. Our was, was two longs. So uh, we had a little switchboard in St. Peter, and so I don't ever remember not having a telephone. Ed, did your mother ever pick up the phone and listen to somebody else's conversation? I'm sure she did, but she objected when people listened to hers. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think she did it very much, uh, because if you, everybody listened, then the quality of the transmission deteriorated very rapidly. Mm -hmm. So if everybody got on the line, you, you didn't hardly get any signal. You would have been very young at this time, but I want to know if you remember when Pearl Harbor happened. Oh, you bet. What can you tell us about that? Well, I guess one of kind of shock. We took the Decatur Herald paper, and we got that every day, and on the back page of the Decatur Herald, there were all these World War II scenes and the Pearl Harbor scenes, uh, and these were wire photos from the AP Wire Photo Service, so that those, those pictures could be transmitted as early as that. And so the Decatur Herald was our newspaper, and Decatur Herald and Review on Sunday, but it was a Decatur Herald, I think, during the week. Did you have an appreciation of what you were looking at? You must have been about eight at the time. Yeah, again, I think that you, you picture these things probably somewhat differently than they are, but the, the Decatur Herald had enough photos that I think your, your picturing of things was reasonably accurate. So they had the whole back page, you would have, I'd say, four to eight photos on the back. And I don't know if they did it on Sunday, but they certainly did it during the week. So every day there was, as I remember, uh, there was photos like this. So I think we were reasonably well, you know, we had a reasonable picture of what was going on. Mm -hmm. How did your life or the life on the farm change after that? 
Oh, not a lot. You know, a lot of the young men left. Anybody, uh, relatives of yours? That oh, you yes, had? yeah, lots of cousins. And uh, they, uh, I was too young. Our whole family, my oldest brother was too young. He was born in 29, so he would have been 12 or so when World War II started. So none of us were in World War II, but uh, all of us probably have been in the Army since. Uh, I was only in for a mm -hmm. brief period of time. I'm not sure if my youngest brother was ever in. But World War II is a time when there's obviously a severe labor shortage, and farming at that time was very labor intensive. Well, I guess that's why Dad had five boys. Uh, <laughs> so we had uh, we had uh, uh, probably a surplus of labor at our place, if you didn't count weed and the strawberry patch and a few things like this. But uh, basically, uh, you know, everything was done by hand. Now we had a tractor that pulled a disc and a plow and things like this. Uh, we had a power takeoff combine, and I don't remember when we bought that, but initially we started, you know, everything was thrashed. So you shocked wheat, you shocked red top, you shocked oats, and then there was a thrashing ring, and your neighbors were in the thrashing ring, so they went from farm to farm, and uh, they, you know, everybody helped everybody else. So I don't remember us really being labor short. Uh, I think that we were far enough from St. Louis and places like this where they were making airplanes and stuff mm -hmm. of this nature that we didn't really participate in that. But, you know, the Depression. So there was a, a lot of people looking for jobs in the 30s in particular. But you finally got some money on the farm during the Second World War, I would think. Well, I guess. I guess I didn't ever think we didn't have money. We just didn't have very much. And uh, I think the thing that we limped through World War II on was inadequate automobile. We had uh, the first car, remember, was a 28 Chevy, a four-cylinder. When did they get that? Oh, I think Dad bought it new, probably, uh, in 28. Then we had a 36 Chevy, and then a 41 Chevy. And I think we entered World War II in that 41 Chevy. But... Uh, you know, a trip to St. Louis was a trip. I mean, you had planned that for weeks. <laughs> and it was 95, 100 miles. So uh, that was our place to go. You know, we went to a ball game or two, and we went to uh, see my uncle and aunt who lived in St. Louis. And uh, Dad had some cousins there. And uh, so we, we'd, we'd visit them once in a while. Do you remember gasoline or tires being rationed during that time? Yeah. Uh, tires were a real problem in World War II. Uh, I remember boots in tires because you had, uh, you know, they all were tube types, but you'd had to put boots in them. They even had what they called reliners that went all the way across the inside of the tire, which was sort of a woven piece of rubberized material. Uh, but uh, I believe we went to the Gebhardt store in Vandalia, which was a county seat, and I believe we had enough either coupons or permits or whatever you needed to buy tires. So we got out of those reline booted tires into something that was a little better. And I believe it was a Gebhardt store in Vandalia that we were able to get those. Would it have been easier to get tires for the tractor and to get fuel for the tractor? Well, originally a lot of the tractors were on steel wheels. So they, did, they didn't come out with rubberized tractor tires. I think Alice Chalmers was among the first. Now, that would have been probably in the late 30s. But our old CCKs was on steel wheels, and we put it on rubberized. I mean, it cut it down, put rims on it, and it made it a rubberized version. And I don't remember when we did that. My uncle Sam, who I mentioned earlier, had an M. Farmel that I think he bought in 1940. 40 or 41, so he had a pretty new tractor all through mm -hmm. World War II. Uh, but our tractor was an adequate tractor. It just, uh, you know, once you ha you couldn't get a new one. I mean, it, it, they weren't made. So, uh, well, maybe they were made a little, but you had to be pretty high on the list to get anything yeah. like that. The cars weren't made, so you couldn't buy a new car. So, But there was enough gas, at least, to keep the, uh, the, the farm equipment running. Yeah, well, we didn't use much. I mean, you know, five gallon of gas was quite a bit of gas. Uh, you know, you you didn't you didn't uh, 
well, we had gas in 40, you know, in barrels, 40-gallon barrels. And our gas man was Jimmy Irvin, and he delivered it in five-gallon cans and filled the barrels. So it was a different scene. Now, later he went to a pump on the truck, and he could pump it. But uh, initially it was done in, I think, five-gallon cans. Okay. Did you have plumbing growing up? Indoor no, plumbing? No, it was all outdoor. We didn't have out there indoor plumbing until probably the mid to late 40s. I don't remember the year, but my guess, 47 plus or minus a year. Well, after the Second World War. After the Second World War. And it's hard for any of us today to look back, especially if you haven't experienced that directly, say, they lived without electricity? They had no indoor plumbing? Yeah, that's right. And you took a bath on Saturday night whether you needed it or not. <laughs> Because otherwise we must all smell the same because nobody knows we. <laughs> and you went to those uh, one or two room schoolhouses like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And most kids wore overalls, and uh, oh, some would wear a belted pants, but uh, not that many. Most wore overalls. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned Red Top quite a bit earlier. I'm not familiar with that. Well, Red Top was in our area was a fairly low input crop. In other words, you whatever grew is what you got. But we had 40 acres of red top and uh, uh, the elevator in St. Peter, which was the Schnocky, Borchelt Schnocky elevator, had a big red top reprocessing plant. I mean big for uh, at that time. And uh, so red top was a I don't know what they used it all for. I mean, it was a grass seed. It was kind of like brown top and not that different from bluegrass, but uh, basically it, it produced a seed which was very small, and uh, I don't know where it all went. I can't tell you that. It wasn't used for your own use? It was no, no. a cash crop? No, we didn't use it. We used the hay, you know, if you threshed it. We had to thresh it with the threshing machine, and then you used the hay. And there, you see, instead of, you bagged it in uh, in nice, heavy, uh, I think they were called denim bags at mm -hmm. that point. And so they were not the, the woven, the normal woven bag. They were much heavier. You had draft horses on the farm, at least in earlier stages of your life. Does that mean that you grew your own oats as well? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oats was grown for horses in particular. And we... Oats was always, uh, you know, it got too warm too quick for oats to be a good crop. But wheat was uh, a substantial crop, and oats was probably lower acreage than wheat. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, you know, 160 acres, we probably had 40 acres of pasture and 40 acres of red top. So you end up with 80 acres of corn and uh, wheat and oats. And Not, like no soybeans, so. Not not then, not early. Soybeans, the first soybeans, remember, were used for hay. And uh, that would have probably been, I don't think we grew many soybeans until about the end of World War II, maybe a little earlier. Okay. Because you couldn't really process them. You know, we got combines in, and so you needed a combine to process them. Can you tell me a little bit about the crop rotation that you that your father would have had? Well, I'm not sure I remember it real distinctly, but the crop rotation was as much to control weeds as it was to uh, uh, be a fertility consideration. Uh, we put all the manure on the cornfield, and uh, I believe we always put some fertilizer on wheat. Uh, I know our drill had a fertilizer box on the, in addition to a seed box, and we, if you'd sell, a, say, a cow, or some pigs, they went to East St. Louis, and the truck taken to East St. Louis would bring fertilizer back. And usually this was a mixed blend fertilizer, and we used that particularly on wheat. Mixed blend meaning what? Well, it was NPK. Nitrogen was the first number, phosphorus second number, and K the third number. Oh, probably 12, 12, 12, 10, 10, 10. They but manufactured tended. fertilizer. It was manufactured, right. Okay. And it was, uh, so, so we used fertilizer on wheat ever since I could remember. Uh, on corn, uh, I don't think we use much fertilizer except for manure. And uh, we had enough cows, so hauling manure was a wintertime job and all-time job, basically. And so that was, uh, 
And so you ended up plowing, you know, hauling manure, plowing, and then planting corn. So, you know, to be timely, now again, you didn't have a large acreage, so, but to be timely, you still had to do all those things before you could plant your corn. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think all the people had two row planters, you know, two horses pulled a two row planter. Was the corn the most uh, labor intensive crop you had? Oh, I think maybe if you look at it from uh, the total tillage operation through shucking by hand, probably so, uh, because we didn't have corn pickers. We had our first corn picker was mounted on an M farm hall. It's called a 2ME, International 2ME, which was a nice picker. Now, there were some earlier ones. There were some pull types. But ours was always mounted. Now, there was new idea of pull types in our area, and John Deere had a pull type. Uh, but, uh, you know, shucking corn, you know, I used to say if you got through by Thanksgiving, you had a, you know, a, that was a pretty good year. And we stored it all as ear corn, and you could take fairly high moisture corn because it was had air space, and, you know, the cribs were fairly narrow, so they didn't uh, have a problem. You didn't have to dry it. We had no way to dry it anyway. So uh, I would think that you could probably start shucking corn when it was 20, 25 percent moisture, and it would keep it no problem. You didn't use any silage then? Oh, yeah, we used silage. We always had a silo. It wasn't very big, but uh, the silo... Oh, I'd say that we, you know, you cut the corn green, and we used machetes, I guess. We, we called them corn knives, but people in the Central America call them machetes. But basically... You're uh, just walking down the field with your... And you'd cut it off, and you'd, you know, you'd lay across the rows, and they'd come pick it up. Uh, then we had something we called sleds, which was, went between two rows, and it had an angle blade on each side and it would eventually cut the corn off, and one horse pulled it. And so it would take two rows, uh, you know, one row kept it from going one way or the other. And so that was much faster than, uh, but you had to stop the horse, uh, you know, because you had, you could, you know, after you had an arm full of corn, you had to lay it down. And at least I remember stopping. And uh, then we had corn binders. Gee, we, I don't think we ever had a corn binder. But anyway, uh, they came along and things of that nature. So, uh, yeah, silage was was a big deal. During the harvest season and during the planting season, did you have to take some time off from school? No. No, uh, school was up, always pretty important with my parents. Uh, the parochial, the, yeah, the, uh, the uh, public school, which was a half mile from our farm, started later and got out a month earlier than we did on the Lutheran school. So if I remember right, they got out in April where we got out the end of May, middle, the first part of June, and they got out at least a month earlier than we did. Now we might have started roughly mm -hmm. the same time, but they got out a little earlier. So here you are, you're, uh, when you come home from school, you probably go to the fields and do some serious chores if you're walking and uh, you're working up a sweat and you're taking a shower one day, or a bath one day a week. Well, generally the routine was not to, you didn't, if you went to school, you generally didn't have to do field work. So generally we had, a, you know, we milked cows in the morning, we milked cows at night. Now you had to do chickens and pigs and all that stuff, sometimes twice a day, but Often it was just once a day. And uh, so anyway, uh, but the night chore was always milking the cows. And everybody seemed to come home at a delayed rate. So if you got home early, you might milk more cows than if you got home <laughs> late. <laughs> so, I don't imagine that's something that the siblings would argue about, was it? Well, you know, we could argue about anything. <laughs> My mother always said it was a wonder we all were alive. <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit about what holidays were like in the Rungi household? Well, I'm sure the biggest holiday was always Christmas. But uh, uh, in Christmas, you know, this is something we take for granted. But I remember in early years of grade school, we always, you know, at New Year, or Christmas Eve, we had a program. And we presented it to the congregation in our church. And uh, at the end of the program, you got a sack, and in the sack there would be peanuts and English walnuts and pecans and an orange and some candy and things like this. 
But I would say that the orange that we got at Christmas was almost the only orange we saw in many of those early days. Uh, so again, uh, bananas, yeah, there were some bananas. But uh, again, uh, I don't remember them early on. I remember them a little later. Now, we didn't, we didn't have a problem with what we ate. I mean, we had plenty to eat. But uh, the diet was different than it is today. And the other thing is that in the summertime, if you work, let's say you, you, know, you baled hay, uh, you could, uh, when I worked, often we had breakfast, and usually breakfast around 6 o'clock. Then they might have a morning lunch, 9, 9.30. Then they'd have a noon meal, and that was 12 to 1. And then they'd have an afternoon lunch, which was 3 o'clock. And then you had dinner, which was somewhere around 6.30. And uh, so how many calories did we eat? I don't know, but we, we burned them all. I mean, we were skinny. Not skinny in the sense of being too thin, but we didn't gain weight. We grew normally, but we didn't gain weight because we were eating too much. We gained weight because we were going to burn it up you know, doing something else. I suspect there was plenty of muscle and gristle on those bones. I guess so. I, I you know, uh, I, I think we had our, our share of that. For the Thanksgiving and the Christmas time was the big event then, the, uh, the meals? Yeah, but we did a lot of things. We celebrated birthdays, anniversaries, and things like this. We played cards. You know, we'd go and we'd have progressive pinochle where, you know, we, we'd, go, we'd go play something they call sheep's head which uh, generally we had 10 kernels of corn, and, and it was a, uh, a very rapid pace game. You had a very small deck of cards, and five could play. You could actually play with six, but four was the minimum, and we played that. Another game we played was something called Solo, and I remember a game, but I, don't re I haven't played it in years and years, called Rook, R-O-O-K. But we did this, and we made homemade ice cream. You know, we got ice at the ice you know, there was a, somebody had ice in town, so we could make homemade ice cream and things like that. I mean, we we enjoyed those things, mm -hmm. and everybody made a cake or pies or something. So we we had we had fun. We really did. Were these events uh, extended family events? Yes, they would be. See, my mother's uh, brothers and sisters lived nearby. My uh, dad's sister and brother, in particular, uh, two of them. Uh, lived uh, very close, and then he had a bunch of cousins, which were like my uncles, and we, uh, you know, we went to their houses as well. So I would say that we had something to do in terms of a birthday or an anniversary or a, some kind of reason for getting together fairly frequently. So, uh, so it was, it was, uh, well. That's how we we enjoyed ourselves together, and, and really, and by to kids' standards today, they would probably, be, well, if they were in our shoes, they'd have done it the same way, but they have a different set of things to do. Mm -hmm. Let's get you into your high school years, and I want to know what during those years your career aspirations were. Well, high school, in contrast to grade school, was again. See, I was going through high school in 47 to 51. I'm a Depression era, era baby, so there weren't many in my high school class. I think it might have started with about 30, and it wasn't unusual for kids to drop out of school after a couple of years. So in my high school graduating class, I was 24 or 25. We were not the smallest class in the high school, but very close. We didn't have enough kids to, you know, baseball and basketball in particular. Particularly basketball was the big sport we went to in the wintertime. Uh, we didn't have enough kids for football and probably didn't have enough money for the uniforms and things like that. But they dropped band when I was in high school because they didn't have enough kids. Uh, they didn't have, they didn't offer physics when I was in high school because there weren't enough kids. And they didn't have enough, uh, I think if they had had enough kids they would have had the teacher that could have done it so uh, so high school was I guess the teen years where you're kind of figuring out who you are and what you're, you're going to become so I always had the idea you know I was there was I had four brothers so there wasn't enough room for everybody to stay home so my room next, in terms of staying the, on that on, farm. on the farm so my young the next youngest brother Robert is the one that farms the farm that we've had 
so on. He farms my, the land that I've got. And uh, anyway, uh, uh, my oldest brother became an insurance agent. My next oldest brother, they ran a restaurant, and he also drove school buses and things like that. Well, I always was determined I was going to go on to college. And so there were never any doubt in my mind that I was going to go on. And I wrote on a county scholarship exam for Fayette County and happened to get the Fayette County scholarship to go to the University of Illinois. And so I went there and started in September of 51. And I think tuition was, see, I had a scholarship so I didn't have to pay tuition, but I think the most I ever paid was like $80 per semester. To, uh, and they might have been fees or something. You know, you had to pay a number of these things. But uh, I had a meal job, and Dad gave me his checkbook and said, no, I don't expect you to write many checks, but <laughs> if you have to write a check, you got to write a check. And uh, so I had a meal job. And so basically I didn't have any particular problems, uh, you know, making ends meet. And so uh, Illinois, I graduated there in 55, but I remember distinctly going to Huff Gym as a freshman, and all the freshmen were there. And the, I remember the person up in front either said it or intimated that, you know, look around you, in a couple of years, only half of you will be here. And I was pretty sure I was going to be in the half that I was going to be there. <laughs> and so it worked out very well. But those last couple of years in high school, you didn't know exactly what you wanted to do other than to get to college? No, I, my chemistry teacher. I enjoyed my chemistry teacher, and I do well in chemistry, and I sort of thought I wanted to be a chemist until I took quantitative analysis. And then I said, hey, you know, if I got to pipe at this smelly stuff and, you know, have these smoky labs to go through, there's surely something I'd rather do better. So that's really when I got into soil science because <coughs> you can apply a lot of chemistry in soil science and... Uh, you could be outdoors, or at least you didn't have to stick your nose in a laboratory all the mm -hmm. time. So that's how I got into soil science. Was what was your major in college? I actually got my bachelor's in ag education, and I did my practice teaching at Altamont. And from uh, there, I was offered a job a couple places, and I decided I wanted to go on to graduate school pretty, pretty much uh, about my junior year. And so I went to the University of Illinois and got a master's degree. And then I went back and picked up, oh, physical chemistry, physics, mm -hmm. uh, math through calculus, and all these sorts of things, which I hadn't taken after I went into the ag education curriculum. Were there some professors who were steering you in that direction? Yeah. Again, I took, I mentioned my high school chemistry teacher. I think her name was Mrs. Maladra. Uh, I had a person in soils. His name was, was Weimer, Dr. Weimer. And uh, he was uh, a very strict disciplinarian, uh, but I think one of the more effective teachers in the College of Agriculture. And so I decided, hey, I believe this is something that I can do. And, you know, it's sort of tied to my chemistry leanings. And so I took that beginning soils and uh, pretty much decided at that point that's the direction I would probably go. And then I had... Uh, Oh, some mentors like Dr. Russell Dell and uh, John Alexander and people like this were on the faculty in the agronomy department. M.B. Russell a little later, uh, Walt Jacobs, Marl Thorne. Uh, all these guys were, uh, you know, we all have our mentors. Mm -hmm. I mean, without them, we don't get there. I uh, wanted to go back just a couple years, though. Uh, you graduated from high school, you said, in spring of 1951. Right. Were you accepted into the, into the University of Illinois already at that time? Uh, I had the county scholarship, so I was either going to go to Southern or Eastern if I didn't get the county okay. scholarship. My question is, June of 1951, uh, the Korean War starts, and I would think people of your age and your brother's age uh, that has a certain relevance for you. Well, I, I had a Korean War deferment, and uh, I did have a friend who went to school with me for two years, went into the Korean War, uh, and then I ended up getting all the way, so you could go through your bachelor's degree on a Korean War deferment. Uh, somehow or another, the Korean War, I forget when it ended. Um, July 1953. So anyway, uh, and once it ended, there was a relaxation of the people that had deferments. 
I just so realized. I got I ended up getting my master's degree, and then I went to Michigan State to work on a PhD, and I was immediately classified one A, and I was going to be drafted, and that would have been uh, uh, January of '58. So I enlisted in the Army of the Reserves and went to Fort Leonard Wood. So I did my military service mostly at Fort Leonard Wood and then uh, in the Reserves after that. Okay. And uh, then I, I actually taught high school in Indianapolis. I taught uh, chemistry and physical science at Broad Ripple High School for a year when my wife was finishing her nursing degree at DePaul and they did their uh, nursing work at Methodist Hospital in Indianapolis. So that's how I got to Indianapolis. Well, I need to correct the record because I made a grave error myself. The Korean War started in June of 1950 while you would have still been in high school then. Okay. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit more about meeting your wife. Well, her she had a grandmother who lived in Vandalia, and so I met her at the Toot and Tell in Vandalia. The Toot and Tell. <laughs> yeah, it was a drive-in. I mean, you could honk your horn and then somebody would come out and take your order, and, or you could go inside. But that was the name of the place, so that's how I met my wife. Were you working there? Uh, I actually had done my practice teaching in Aldemont, and somehow we found ourselves in Vandalia one night. And uh, so we met there. It would have been, gee, that would have been the summer of 54. Were you both customers there? I guess so. I guess that's why we were there. Uh, I mean, I don't remember that. I know that you could uh, dance inside. Uh, I mean, you know, it was a, a very different kind of an atmosphere than probably today. But, uh, but anyway, that's where we met. What, what was her name? Uh, her, her maiden name was Rice, and her grandmother's name in, in Vandalia was Ray. In fact, she has an aunt who is 104 years old this past September, who is still living in Vandalia, and uh, her name is Helen Ray. Her, uh, uh, she had an uncle, uh, Bill Ray, and another uncle, Leland Ray, and uh, Bill Ray lived to be 100 plus, and Leland, I think, was 96, and now Leland's wife is Helen, and she's 104. <laughs> but her mother died early. She had uh, uh, a cancer that she died early, so we miss her. What was her first name? Nellie Ray. Nellie Ray was your her. wife's first name. Oh, Patricia. Okay, and was she a student at the same time? At uh, that time, she was. She was a couple years younger than me, and so she would have been. She might have just completed her first year at DePaul, I believe. She went to DePaul, Greencastle, Indiana, and I think she had just completed her first year because I know driving back and forth to, to Greencastle was uh, uh, something I, I used to know the road pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect so. Uh, what was she majoring in? Uh, she always wanted to be a nurse, and so she was in their nursing class, and they changed. She, uh, uh, so anyway, that was her, her desire. So her aunt was a nurse in World War II, her aunt uh, from her mother's sister, and so somehow or another, I think that's always was in her background. Was she a farm girl herself? Oh yes, yeah, yeah. They had a big farm. They had 240 acres. <laughs> oh my! <laughs> so it was a bigger farm than ours. And you were married in when? In 1956. So you were in the middle of graduate school at that time. Yeah, I had been one year in, in my master's degree and one year to go. So. Your major then, once you got to graduate school, was agronomy, as I understand. Well, actually, I did a soil science, but I actually did an agronomy degree. Uh, my, uh, my, uh, I've always been interested in, you know, if you walk around on a farm, you see that corn grows better in one place than another, or wheat grows better in one place than another. And so uh, we were interested in the impact that weather has on, uh, on crop yields. So I started using... Uh, uh, this is where I got into my weather by crop stuff, and uh, uh, we used a computer that was produced by the Department of Defense at the University of Illinois, and their payoff for making this computer was they got a copy of their own. So it was called the ILIAC, and the ILIAC was a tube-type computer, 
so it wasn't transistor, so it, was, it filled a room as big as this, easy. And, uh, you know, they had modules, so if I remember the modules, they were about two foot square, and they must have been standardized in some way, and so they would check those modules on a frequent basis. So anyway, I, I did my, uh, my analysis on an IBM accounting machine. We converted the results to paper tape, and the paper tape went through the iliac, and it inverted the matrix and did the multiple correlation, which no one had done before that, as near as I know. I was going to say, this is very cutting-edge stuff at that, that time. That was. No one had ever done it. <laughs> and so these were, these were things that, uh, that uh, not many places could do. I mean, you mentioned weather by crop. I'm not sure I understand what that means. Well, you know, we've had a lot of years where the weather has not been very good. 1954, 1980, 1988. Well, much of your very young, earliest years were some very bad years for weather. Yeah, well, again, I don't remember them very well, but, uh, you know, if you look at the Dust Bowl era, which started in the early 30s and really didn't end until almost the 40s, if you go to the western Corn Belt, there were 12 years in a row of below average trend, I mean, below trend line yields for that part of the world. And Illinois didn't have that many in a row, but we had a good share. But I distinctly remember bad years. 54 was the very first one. 1980 was a very hot year. 1988 was a bad year. And so uh, all those years show up as a, a weather problem, basically. And that was something that you always found interesting in terms of... Well, it was something that, uh, you know, been able to analyze the records and to find out that most of the repression in corn yields, in particular, which is what I studied, was due to bad weather. So it either rained too much or too little, mostly too little, and it was too hot. So. I know you grew up on a farm where you had a little bit of everything. Uh, um, did you also have an interest in the animal science side of things? Oh, to a very large degree. Yeah. Uh, I guess uh, probably the dairy cattle. You know, there was a time when I was probably more interested in, in cows than than most. Dad had registered cattle, and we had milking shorthorn, and we eventually went to all, all Holsteins. And so we found that the Holsteins could produce a lot more milk than the milking shorthorn, but if you wanted, milking shorthorn was called a dual purpose breed. They were good for milking as well as for beef and for eating. And so, uh, but we went to uh, milking shorthorn, you know, association meetings in Illinois, different places. So uh, so there was a time when animals were pretty high on my list. Uh, at the end of the master's degree, and you got that in 1957, I understand. Yeah. Um, then you had the time in the military. Well, I actually went to Michigan State in July of, of 57, and I worked on a soil survey in the lower peninsula at Everett was a county seat, and uh, Osceola County. And then I went to Michigan. They were on a quarter system, and school didn't start there until they had one quarter before Christmas. So school started essentially the 1st of October. And I was immediately classified 1A when I went to Michigan State. So uh, the, uh, the, uh, I went to school in the fall, went home for Christmas, and checked with the draft board, and they basically said you'd be drafted in January or February, depending on how many they had to send. So I enlisted in the, uh, in the National Guard and went to Fort Leonard Wood in late January of 58. So I never did go back to Michigan State. Uh, it was, was this in the Illinois National Guard? Yes. It would have been a unit out of Vandalia that I enlisted. What was in. the unit? I don't remember. Was it an infantry unit at that time? Probably, probably. It might have been a motorized infantry unit or something like that. But uh, I just don't remember. Okay. So it doesn't sound like you spent too much time in the National Guard. No. I actually, see that uh, I was able to go for six months, and then I was in the active reserves for a while after that. And uh, then Sputnik flew over in 1957, if you remember yeah. correctly. And it would have been the fall of 57. And so all of a sudden, science was very critical in the U.S.'s thinking. Ah. And so you then had, if you were a scientist, 
you had different priorities than if you didn't have, you weren't a scientist. And so basically the Sputnik era started in, I don't know, it was October or something like that in 57 when it went over. And you know, we heard these beep beeps and beep beeps or whatever it was when it uh, went over. And uh, the government valued science and so National Science Foundation was formed. And there was money to, for scientists to get additional training and things like this. So things changed quite a bit. In other words, you were more valuable sitting in a classroom and working in a, uh, a, a science lab than you were in uniform. Evidently, that was a decision. So, so see, then I went to, I, I say, I, I finished a one year at Broad River High School. My wife finished her nurse's training, and I moved to Iowa State in 59. And uh, uh, so I was on the faculty at Iowa State while I got my degree. And it's still, it was a, mm -hmm. it was a good, a very good decision. I had some excellent people there. Does that mean that you were wanting to stay in education? You wanted to teach, but you wanted to teach at the college level? And Yeah, I, I guess I always uh, had pretty well decided that I was probably going to go into the professorial ranks, probably by my master's degree. And, uh, but, uh, you know, Michigan was having problems with funding. I would have gone back to Michigan State, except... I found out that they, their, their support was $200 a month and you had to pay tuition. And in Illinois, if you had a graduate assistantship, you didn't have to pay tuition. Iowa State, you didn't. So you ended up with paying three, three months of tuition because you had three quarters. And then you had $200 a month. You couldn't live on $200 mm -hmm. a month when you had to pay three of those months to, uh, for tuition. So it was, uh, it was, it was hard to make it go. So that's why you didn't select Michigan State. That's why I didn't go back. I went back to Iowa State. So, and but I'm curious to understand why an Illinois farm boy goes to Iowa State instead of the University of Illinois. Well, there is really a kind of an understanding that unless there are unusual circumstances, it's not uh, professionally correct to get all your degrees at one school. You need to experience different thought patterns, different scientific philosophies to the degree that you can in your graduate program. So that's why I didn't go on in Illinois. I could have, but I was discouraged from doing that because I already knew all the people in my bachelor's and master's degree. So some of your mentors, your college professors, were saying you need to go someplace else to get That's your... right. They, they were actively pushing me somewhere else. So I actually interviewed at Iowa State, Wisconsin, Michigan State, don't think I went to Purdue because I consider Purdue to be too close to Illinois. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, those were the three places I looked at. And what little I know about agricultural schools in the United States, the University of Illinois has an outstanding reputation, but Iowa State does as well. There's a lot of good schools. I, I, I'd put uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, Iowa State, Illinois, Missouri, Kansas State. You know, they're, they're not necessarily the best in everything but they're the best in a lot of areas. And so you can get a good education at many different schools. Mm -hmm. You know, the East Coast, Cornell was looked at, UC Davis, Texas A&M where I am now, uh, et cetera. So but most of these schools that you mentioned in terms of agriculture are the old land-grant colleges. Yeah, yeah, they're all land-grant colleges, that's right. They're all the land-grant colleges. Okay. Uh, tell us a little bit about that time then when you are, you are at uh, Iowa State University and you mentioned already that you were on the faculty as well as being a, a yeah my there. I had two the head of the department was a guy named Dr. Pierre and uh, he was insistent that I come there the first time but I didn't want to work with the person he wanted me to work with and uh, so when I contact him again later about two years later uh, uh, he had a a faculty position which he said uh, I'll just make that a research associate position till you get your degree, and then we'll have you on the faculty. Well, in those days, the department heads probably have more leeway than they maybe do now, but uh, the guy was, uh, I mean, he believed in me, and uh, obviously I had to produce. And uh, then I had a, you know, another professor, uh, Professor Frank Regan was my graduate school advisor, and he was an excellent person. And so 
it was well for me to go to another school. I mean, it was, it was born out. It wasn't that the people of Illinois weren't, say, equally good or et cetera, or Michigan State or any other place. It's just that you need to experience a different set of people. You've got to prove to them you can do it, mm -hmm. so to speak. What, did, uh, what was your Ph.D. Uh, dissertation on? Well, actually, I compared a bunch of soils in southern and west, southwest and southeast Iowa, and we were particularly interested in the phosphorus weathering regimes in those soils. And so Dr. Reekin was, uh, was my advisor, and uh, I would say he kind of pointed the direction, and it was your baby, you mm. know, and, uh, and that's what you expect. I mean, you got in the graduate game, in a prof professorial game, you really have to set your own agenda because nobody's going to tell you what you have to do. They might tell you you got to teach this class, but then what are you going to do? So, uh, so I've I've been lucky to have people that believed I could do it and uh, hired me and said, "Hey, here's your job. Go to it." And you, and it worked very well. You got your PhD in what year then? Sixty-three, and. At the time you got your Ph.D., what were your, your career intentions? I planned to stay at Iowa State, and uh, shortly after I got my degree, probably would have been early July, I had a Dr. Peer came to me and said, Illinois wants to talk to you about going back to Illinois. And so anyway, uh, I went for an interview, and our kids were, what, three and four, well, one was, I guess, almost four, and the other one would have been uh, six months. And we decided that, hey, Grandpa and Grandma are uh, 35, 45 miles away or 100 miles away, and here we're four or 500 miles away. And so, uh, and I liked Illinois, and uh, I thought I could do the job, and they offered me the job, and that's where I went. So I was at Illinois 10 years. Was Patricia nursing at that time? Yeah, she worked at McFarland Clinic in Iowa. Uh, and uh, we also had our kids at that point. So both of our kids were born in Ames. And then she worked in uh, Urbana. Uh, she could, didn't work full time because the kids were, were pretty small, but she worked at the University Hospital in particular, uh, not on a full time basis, but on a part time basis. So, uh, and she did that when we moved to Missouri as well. I know that being a college professor um, is kind of a mixture of being a teacher, but also of doing research, and especially in a field like you were in. Uh, how did those things sort themselves out in your life? Well, the, the standard appointment in the College of Agriculture is to have a teaching appointment and a research appointment. And the research, the teaching appointment can be more than half or less than half. In my case, my first job at Illinois was a, a research and extension appointment. The research appointment was, I think, 30%, and the extension appointment was 70%. After, <clears throat> I think I'd been in that job two years, another position came available, which was more research and teaching. So I really kind of wanted to get back into formal classroom teaching. And so I went in into about a third teaching appointment and two thirds research appointment, and so so anyway, uh, and I like that, and it worked very well for me. But I, I still like the extension role. The extension role basically is to uh, convey the information that people can use to them in such a way that they can understand it and apply it. Uh, so you're working with the larger community at, at that point? Yes, you were. So you essentially had all these county agents in Illinois at that point. You know, in Sangamon County was Denver Corn, and Logan County was a guy named Harold Brinkmeyer, and uh, Macoupin County was Orville Mowry, and, you know, I can list them all, basically. They're, most of them are, you know, not living any longer. But they were your clientele because they convened the meetings of the farmers and the people that they wanted you to meet and, and visit with, and so uh, so it was a it was it was a good experience. You had to learn how to sell yourself. You know, basically how to sell yourself. What essentially were you talking to them about then? Oh, it was often about productivity issues. Why does this soil produce less than that one? 
uh, what can you do about it, and, and things of this nature. I actually taught, well, I think I mentioned to you, I taught an extramural course here in Springfield. Uh, probably would have been about 64 or 65, <coughs> and my my students were basically the county agents. Now they had ag teachers, they had soil conservation service, I had uh, rural appraisers, uh, things like this, farm managers, rural appraisers. Uh, we had, I think, 21 people in that course. There were some assistant county agents. Uh, you know, basically, it was a whale of a good experience. That's where I really learned how the county programs worked was in that particular program. And it, uh, it enhanced my reputation with these people. So I was a pretty busy guy after that. What was the nature of your research at that time? Uh, I was still in the soil phosphorus game. Uh, we were, you know, this whole idea of environmental concerns, one of the big problems is phosphorus. And phosphorus is in our soaps, it's in our lots of things we use. Uh, so it's a ubiquitous kind of a, of a phenomenon. And in soils, the soils, we have to put phosphorus on soils to get them to produce adequate crop growth. Uh, it's not the only thing we have to put on, but it has to be there in adequate supply. Does that strengthen the root system? or? Oh, it, it just, uh, I always, people ask me, what do you do in the soil and crop sciences agronomy? And I give them a short, we make plants grow better. Basically, we do the genetics, we do the fertility, we do the water, uh, etc. And so the whole thing blends together in such a way that uh, you, uh, you know, you don't necessarily have the same problem. But if, if a county agent might take you to a, a farmer and say, you know, this farmer's concerned, and, you know, what's he doing wrong on this piece of land? It, it doesn't produce the way it should. Well, sometimes the answer was pretty obvious, and sometimes it was not so obvious. But uh, basically, you found out that you could help these people quite a bit. So uh, it, was a, it was a good experience. And once I went into the teaching research appointment, I then had more graduate students. And I taught undergraduates and graduate students. And I taught a soils course that I called the dynamics mm -hmm. of soils, and rather than the statics of soils. So uh, how does it scrub the phosphorus out of these systems, you see? How sophisticated or how well could you analyze soil samples during that time frame? Oh, pretty well. Uh, we have, the big thing that's happened is that we've mechanized it and we've streamlined the equipment. But we used to use flame photometers and spectrophotometers and, uh, and things of this nature. And we had probably pH meters now. They still have all those things. But they have them much more computer driven so they can do in sequence or there's a robot that runs the samples through the through this the system etc so i would say that the analysis well let me tell you we used to be what i call idea rich and data poor now we're data rich and i think sometimes <laughs> idea poor because you can generate data so much more readily today than you ever could when i was a graduate student or an early you know younger in my pr professorial days so, so just like the farm has gone from manual labor to everything mechanized, the, the laboratory has gone from a lot of manual labor to pretty much being mechanized. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can now get data much, much more readily. This is probably a good time. I, I always love to hear this discussion myself and hope the, whoever's listening to this will appreciate it as well. But, but uh, the role of nitrogen potassium and a phosphorus mm -hmm. and what it takes to be a good healthy soil well the nitrogen is not held in the soil it's a usually we put it on as ammonia which is then converted to nitrate or we can put it on as urea which is converted to nitrate or we might even put it on as ammonium nitrate which is partially nitrate and partially ammonia but uh, the nitrate moves with the water and so you can't put it on a long time before it's to be used. Uh, we basically say if you could spoon feed the plant with its nitrogen, you'd, you'd be an ideal situation. Well, you have to compromise. And some people still put you know, fertilizer on in the fall after it's cold with a nitrogen inhibitor, nit nitrate inhibitor, in the uh, ammonia or whatever they're using. 
So and that it's released in the spring. So it's released it? later. And, uh, but I'd say there's more and more people putting it on in the spring after it's planted or before it's planted than they used to. And that's nitrogen in particular. So the, the sooner, the, if you put it on when the plant needs it, that's ideal, but you have to compromise. Uh, phosphorus and potassium, uh, the phosphorus generally is, uh, can be put on, it doesn't move very far. The big problem with phosphorus is that it goes from a more use, usable state or a more of a, a state in which plants can pick it up more readily to a state in which it is more fixed. It combines with calcium, say, and it becomes less available. So phosphorus is, uh, again, not nearly as time critical, and it tends to be once it's in the soil, it releases over a long period of time. And so phosphorus is, uh, is an expensive nutrient at this point in time. And again, the placing it into the root zone, if you can put it under the hill of the corn plant, it's better than putting it in between the rows, for example. Now, how because, does the plant use that? Oh, all these energy compounds in a plant are phosphate-type uh, compounds. So the energy transfer mechanisms in plants, and you know, we can go into it, but I'm not an expert in the area. But, you, you know, we have uh, phosphate is a very important energy, you know, translator in our in you know, on our metabolism as well. So the plants need to have the phosphate in it because it takes the sunshine into uh, and the water and the CO2, and it essentially then runs it through the green leaf, and the green leaf stores it then basically into the plant as a starch or things of this nature. So it's, an, it's involved in the energy pathways in particular. Potassium, again, is a very critical we used to have corn that would fall over. Uh, you know, where I grew up in Fayette County, uh, if you didn't put enough potash on, essentially the plants would be, you know, they'd fall over, so it'd be hard to pick. Or in the early days, when you're picking by hand, you don't want to stoop over all the time. So uh, potassium is utilized by the plant in a little different way, but it's, it's a little bit you know, I, I have ways of thinking about it which are not necessarily uh, all that analytical. But I think it's like a good tonic in some ways for the, for the plant. And it's, that's kind of a poor way of saying it. But the plants grow better if it's got an adequate supply of phosphate. Somehow the vascular system seem to operate better with potassium in the system at an adequate level than if they aren't. And so you end up with stronger plants and things of this nature. So, and there's a lot of other nutrients that are used, but in basically those three are the ones we put on what we call macronutrients. And can you talk us through the same kind of discussion on alkaline versus acidic soils? Well, alkaline soils uh, generally in Illinois are high in, they usually have a pH, say, of around 8 to 8.2, and they're usually saturated with calcium carbonate limestone. Uh, so these soils then will fix phosphorus more readily because there's excess calcium. And so they're primarily the less favorable calcium uh, phosphates. In other words, they're, they're less soluble as calcium phosphates than they are as ammonium phosphates or however you put them on. And uh, so these are, that's the big criterion which affects the plant growth on alkaline soils. Now there's other things that probably come in. On acidic soils, uh, if you have them real acid like they used to be, and say a pH of five or even less, uh, number one, the hydrogen ion concentration is pretty high, and then the aluminum becomes soluble. And the aluminum becomes soluble at these lower pHs, and it essentially restricts plant growth because the aluminum then is, is really sort of toxic to the plant. The roots don't go very well, they become gnarly, they are often uh, look sick, I mean they'd be brown instead of white, and things of this nature. So uh, the, the big thing that we used to have something, a guy named Pat Johnson who was a regional agronomist and he lived in Newton, Illinois, but he ran the Newton uh, 
Brownstown, Oblong, Ewing experiment fields. And there's probably more that I'm not mentioning. And Pat had something he called the ABCs of soil fertility. Number A, lime it. B, put on phosphate. C, put on potash. D is nitrogen. But if you don't put on the A, B, C, the nitrogen is not going to do you any good. So, so we had, uh, uh, you know, the soils that I grew up on were not very productive early because they were acidic and they needed uh, supplies. They needed to have their pH changed. And they also didn't have the abundant supply of uh, other nutrients, particularly potassium, that these soils up here would have. And so uh, today, there's still, you know, many things that are better about these darker soils in Sangamon County and northern Illinois than we would say in the grayer soils in Fayette County. But the Fayette County soils are head and shoulders above what they used to be. Uh, you know, if we were, you know, we expect 150 bushel of corn now, uh, and hopefully we'll get more, and sometimes we get less. But I would say the norm, and probably here they're expecting maybe another 30 to 50 bushel above that. So upwards of 200 bushels. Yeah, it's, uh, they don't often, uh, the only county that it might have changed since I've looked at the data but Morgan County in Jacksonville is a county seat. In 204, had a county average of 200, more than 200 bushels of corn. Now that was a record year. I think Fayette County might have had 175, 180. But uh, the whole, uh, it might not have been that high. I think Illinois had 182 or 83 bushel average yield that year. But Morgan County mm -hmm. had above 200 bushel. What's the difference then between those dark, loamy soils that we have around here versus the soils that you had in Fayette County? What makes it darker? Oh, it's organic matter. It's, uh, again, the, the native grasses grew better in these darker soils. They had more fertility, so there was more grass. So there was more organic matter being produced each year. Uh, in Fayette County, the uh, the uh, the the vegetation wasn't nearly as dense as it is here because they just didn't have enough, you know, fertility power as a plant. The power of the plant was much better here than it was there. Well, now, after that basic lesson in agronomy, I guess, in soil science, which was very important for me for the rest of this, can you talk about that critical time when you are doing a lot of extension work? Uh, what, what was the state of farming in the United States and in Illinois at that time? Well, I used to talk about the eras of crop improvement. And I'd, I'd start with probably the 1930s with hybrid corn. And hybrid corn came in, you know, we used to have reeds, yellow, dent, and all these inbreds, or not inbreds, but uh, what we call varieties of corn. And so the hybrids came in, uh, Henry Wallace formed Pioneer in, in Des Moines. Uh, there was a lot of these smaller seed companies here, but the hybrids came in in the late depending on where you were, in the 30s to the early 40s. Was that the Henry Wallace who became Secretary of Agriculture the during the same Same one. Roosevelt he he was also Vice President. Right. Uh, so he was one of the mavericks, I'd say, of, of uh, hybrid corn. But uh, again, we, my dad sold Pioneer corn. And in 19, we had a guy, George E. Eby, who used to live in Morrisonville, Illinois was our regional person and he came down and I think 1948 was the first time we had more than a hundred bushel of corn per acre and it was a good year and we didn't have it I'm sure for a long time after that because the state average yields were probably running in the 60 bushel range in that range maybe a little higher I could actually look it up but uh, anyway uh, so so it was starting to take off at that point. Well, then the next era was the fertility era, particularly nitrogen. The munition plants that were used to make explosives were all of a sudden available for other activities. And most of them were uh, nitrogen manufacturing plants 
you know, you can uh, make ammonia and, you know, it'll explode, and you can make uh, ammonium nitrate, and, you know, that's how uh, some of these terrorists have been. So it's, it's, a, it's a real high-energy compound in the sense that it can be released all at once. So ammonium nitrate became available, and then we had ammonia gas as ammonia, and we injected it into the soil. So I'd say the fertility era started at particularly the nitrogen side, which is what is deficient in growing corn, say. Legumes, uh, you know, alfalfa, soybeans fix their own nitrogen. Uh, but uh, corn, wheat had to have nitrogen to produce max good yields. So the uh, nitrogen era started at the end of World War II, and we pretty well had that pretty well along by the 60s, I would say, early 60s in particular. Well, then the big thing happened, 2,4-D, DDT, came along. And all of a sudden, you could spray those broadleaf weeds, the cockleburrs and the jimson weeds and the button weeds and the pig weeds that we had to pull by hand when we didn't have anything else to do in our cornfields. You could spray them, and they'd die. Uh, I mean, it was magic. Uh, the big... Uh, we then went to a couple pre-planned incorporated uh, atrazine and treflan, atrazine for corn and treflan for soybean. And you could put this on one, the treflan is called yellow herbicide, there's quite a few of those kinds. And the atrazine is still used today. Uh, it's, uh, and it's, uh, corn has a way of not being, it's not toxic to corn. And so you can pre-plant, you know, all of a sudden you can control weeds. So all of a sudden we now have a plant that's got decent hybrids, plant that's powered with some fertility, and we don't have to go out there and pluck weeds or kill a crop of weeds before we plant corn. And so we then moved, I'd say, into that era. Then we moved into the biotech era. Uh, did we, how about the pests? Well, the pests really came along at the same time as the DDTs were uh, the, the insecticides. And so that whole spectrum of things went into the plant pathology in terms of fungicides. We don't use a lot of fungicides, but uh, also corn borer was a problem. And so if you really didn't plant, if you had a corn borer, if you planted early, it tended not to have a big gore problem. If you planted late, you had second, third, fourth crop of corn borer, so you could have a lot of them. And so you'd have to treat for those. So you really then had the, the hybrid technology, which raised yields substantially, the fertility, which then powered those hybrids, genetics, that were incorporated. Then you don't have to control weeds, which are competing for nutrients and water and all these kind of things, because you can now have, control those. And then we went into the biotech era, in which, in, particularly in cotton, see, we had the boll weevil and the boll worm. And a lot of the southeast quit cotton production because of boll weevil. And the boll worm was always a problem. It's the same thing as, you know, the lepidopters, which are in the corn borer area. So these things, you know, would, would ruin a cotton crop. So we had, the first thing that came out was BT cotton. It was a particular bacillus that was incorporated into the cotton genetics. And uh, if the uh, boll worm would eat this, he would have indigestion and die. It was a protein in it, which uh, you know upset his gut, and he would die. So we now have BT corn and BT uh, cotton and, and these sorts of things. But I think the thing that probably came along from a farming perspective was, uh, say, the, uh, the whole idea that you can now spray over the top with Roundup-resistant soybeans. So if you have a Roundup-resistant soybean, you can wait till the weeds grow a little bit and spray the soybeans and the weeds and the whole bit, and the weeds die and the soybean lives. Mm -hmm. So you see clean fields out here. So those are uh, what I call, bi you know, they're, they're changed because we've been able to introduce some genetic information into the genome of the soybean or the cotton or the corn plant, and uh, we can do things we couldn't do before. Can so. you walk through that progression again and put a rough time frame when each one of these really started to, to Well, change? okay, hybrid corn started, I'd say, in the 30s, early 30s, and was pretty well adopted 
by the beginning of World War II, particularly the middle of World War II. Uh, the fertility era, we had some fertilizer, particularly phosphorus fertilizer, but limited nitrogen fertilizer until the end of World War II. And so that came on stream in the late 40s, later 40s, mid 40s to the early 50s. So nitrogen became fairly abundant. Uh, at least you could buy it at a reasonable price. And uh, so then you had that particular area. Then we entered up into the, what I call the, the weed control, the insect control. We had insecticides, herbicides, fungicides. The first that I remember were DDT and 2,4-D. And 2,4-D is still available. I mean, we've used that, lots of it. DDT uh, uh, has been taken off the market because of its uh, perception of being a problem with uh, egg-laying birds in mm -hmm. particular. Uh, but, uh, you know, in the malaria world, taking DDT off the market was not a very wise decision because people die from malaria at a rather alarming rate, and uh, you could control malaria. So anyway, then we have that. So I and would say the time this, frame for that? That would have been, I would say, must have started in the late 50s and uh, then really progresses to the day. But glyphosate was not released, glyphosate or Roundup, was not released uh, until, must have been after 75. So this is, you know, you might use it in your garden or things like this to control weeds. Uh, so it was, uh, I'd say 75, plus or minus a year, but I'd say 75, 77 would be my guess of when it was available. And it was magic. You could spray anything, and it would, you know, it would almost uh, control them without any problem. So that era, uh, I would say the glyphosate was a big change over the others. But there are many ways to control weeds, mm -hmm. and farmers can use them now, and some require more sophistication than others, and glyphosate is probably the most foolproof. But we're now getting weeds that are resistant to glyphosate, and that farmers are going to have to rotate. Uh, and then the biotech really started, I would say, about 1980. And we didn't sell commercial biotech materials until, I think, 1995 was when... Uh, BT cottons became available, BT resistant cottons, or, or so they control the bullworm. And I think that started in 95, 95 or 96. And then uh, we've had all that since then. Would you describe all these changes as evolutionary or revolutionary in terms of their impact on agriculture? Well, a combination of both, I think. You see, we used to have to plow the ground we had to kill a crop of weeds. Uh, we were concerned about the weed control, so it really governed everything you did. Uh, you had rotations because a, a wheat crop would destroy weeds that a corn or soybean crop wouldn't. And so you had some of those things. Or you put it in hay, and you mowed them off three or four times, and you, you control a different set of weeds. So these things were just part and parcel of early agriculture in my life. Uh, now uh, you don't have those restrictions at all. You can go no-till. You can let a crop of weeds grow and you can spray them with Roundup if you don't have moisture problems and you can plant right into the material. So so now we're we're looking at some of these weed control techniques as something we favor because they allow us to control erosion differently than we did before. Is that the advantage of going low-till or no-till then? Yes, that's, that's the big advantage. Plus it saves energy, it saves money. And uh, not all soils are equally easy to do no-till in. If you've got uh, a highly different texture, water status, on one end of the field versus the other end, then it might be too wet to no-till one side and too dry almost on the other side. 
and uh, some farmers still feel like a little tillage will allow them to come, you know, if you don't get a good stand, you compromise your yield to start with. So you got to do what you need to do to get a good stand. And in some cases, it's a little harder to get a good stand with no tillage than it is if you've had some tillage. I thought the purpose of the plowing and, and, and the tilling is to loosen up the soil so that you can get better oxygen take and better, uh, better moisture as well. I, I think we used to think that way, and that's still true of some soils, particularly those that are real high in clay. But uh, particularly if the clay is not what I would call expanding, contracting types. And so you can get crusts and things like this. But for the most part, probably we don't factor up the, uh, the infiltration rate. Actually, we think infiltration is better under no tillage than it is under clean tillage. Hmm. Because the clean tillage, you tend to seal over and you get more erosion because there's more runoff. Uh, but uh, the, uh, I've been to Brazil quite a few times. And again, an awful lot of those hillier soils, you go to western Iowa or even western Illinois, and some of those areas with reduced tillage or no tillage can be farmed much more intensively than if they were tilled and still have a, an acceptable uh, you know, in conservation rate. Okay. Take a different course here just a little bit. Uh, much of what you've been talking about, this is all very innovative stuff, and I'm sure you're learning it about it, you're doing research on it, you're engaging your other colleagues in the university environment and right at the cutting edge of this, and then you're on the other side, you take this out to, in your extension work. How receptive or how resistant were the farmers that you were working with in some of these new ideas? Well, I think originally, just take no-till. There was a guy in, in Kentucky, a guy named Shirley Phillips, who I think is credited with starting no-tillage in those rolling soils of western Kentucky and western Tennessee, which had a high erosion rate. And he went to the idea that, hey, if we till those less, and if we can control weeds and we can you know, uh, plant into this material, maybe we can do something differently about it. And we had a person in it worked at Dixon Springs in Illinois. His name was George McKibben. George McKibben was a fan of Shirley Phillips' idea of no-till. And we had these fescue pastures, grass pastures in Dixon Springs on rolling land. And George said, hey, if we can burn those things down. They used, if I remember right, there was an imperial chemical industries in Britain had a herbicide, which is a burn down, and I forget the name of it. And I think they used that to burn these things down. Uh, anyway, uh, they uh, were then starting to plant. And I think Shirley Phillips and George McKibben were looked upon by the average agronomist in the Midwest as being, hey, I wonder if those guys really know what they're doing. You know, uh, they, uh, they were sort of looked upon as being somewhat far out, I think. Well, they persisted. And once, <coughs> once Roundup became available in the late 70s, early 70s, well, it wouldn't be the early, but I'd say 77, something like that. Once that became available, and you could burn those weeds down with a very environmentally friendly chemical, glyphosate is detoxified very, very quickly, and uh, it's a, you know, plants are, uh, get sick from it and die very uh, uniformly. Uh, all of a sudden we have now a compound which is reasonably exp inexpensive, cheaper than tilling, and uh, we can control that and on sloping soils we can do this. So uh, the sloping soils that have reasonable infiltration rates that had too high of an erosion rate to be intensively farmed can now be farmed rather intensively. And this is true of uh, much of uh, our rolling soils in, in Illinois, western Kentucky, western uh, Tennessee, and, and, you know, I can go on. But it's also very important in southern, southern Brazil where, uh, you know, without uh, no-till, they just have mm -hmm. unacceptable erosion rates. And well, we so want to talk quite a bit more about some of the work you've done in a lot of different countries throughout the world. Um, 
I'd like to go back and, and ask you to reflect on what agriculture was like in the late 60s and through the most of the 70s in terms of the economy as well. Well, I'm not sure. I, I, uh, you might have to ask me another question, but uh, we had dollar corn for a long time, and then we sort of went to two-dollar corn. We had that through essentially 206, maybe even into 207. And uh, two-dollar corn, you know, you, you, you really have trouble making it on two-dollar corn. Now, with expensive energy and things you have now, uh, I think the break-even price on growing corn is much closer to $4 than, than it was. So we're close to a break-even point on corn production probably as we speak because the price of corn mm -hmm. has tumbled dramatically since early September. And uh, same way with soybean. So basically, uh, uh, the whole system of... The thing that many people do not understand is that if you take the country as a whole, agriculture is, produces somewhat of a stable crop. It may be better yields in Indiana than Iowa or wherever, you know. But uh, overall, it doesn't go up and down a lot. Now, we have exceptions to that, 54, 80, you know, back in the 30s, uh, et cetera. So the big thing, though, that a farmer has is if unless he has something to sell, he has no way of getting an income. And so an individual farmer is just part of the puzzle and he's you know he's exposed on risk on weather in particular so is it going to be you know this year planting was a big problem it was too wet for too long for many people and so we got high moisture corn that's still sitting in the field when a lot of people wish they were finished so you end up then with all kinds of weather risk and it can be too dry you know uh, and if it's too dry, 1980, you know, I went back from Columbia, St. Louis to Columbia, Missouri. I think the temperature got to 113 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, I saw those records in 1936 where it got 114 in Illinois, but I didn't think I'd ever see those kind of temperatures. Mm -hmm. Well, when you have that kind of temperature and the corn doesn't have enough water, it just essentially doesn't do anything. So you end up with very poor yields. So, so basically, as I look at this whole business of agriculture, it, the person that's running, you know, uh, General Motors or uh, Microsoft or somebody like this, has an entirely different production. He, if people don't buy the product in adequate amounts, they can, you know, they can produce less. People buy more, they can produce more. A farmer, remember, he's got a fixed acreage. And he's just one of many out there. And it doesn't, you know, uh, I guess my dad used to say, the price is always high when I don't have anything to sell. And it's always low when I got a lot to sell. So uh, sometimes in, uh, we used to say that in a dry year, wheat tend to do better in Illinois than corn. So if you had wheat, you could kind of hedge against a dry year a little bit better than if you didn't have wheat. Well, uh, not much wheat's grown in Illinois now. There's still a fair amount of acreage, but uh, not like it probably was. And it tends to be growing on soils that are moisture deficit in the summer, the area around, mm -hmm. uh, particularly, you know, Greenville and South, where we have a lot of slick spots, that we call them. So having said that, the ag programs have to look at this whole spectrum differently then you look at the manufacturing sector because we were relying on rainfall and sunshine and seed and you know things like this and I'm going to have to buy fertilizer, I'm going to have to buy my seed, I'm going to have to pay for my diesel and if I don't get much yield then I don't have much to sell. Well you're describing a group of people it sounds like riverboat gamblers to a certain extent. Well I expect that a, that a farmer really has to gamble much, much more. Now, uh, he's learned through time that, uh, generally speaking, he'll come out all right most years. But I think he expects one year in 10, maybe two years in 10, where, gosh, it's not as good as I hoped it would be. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. And once in a while it gets 204 when everybody set a record. Well, let's talk about the thing that has bedeviled American agriculture um, for, I would suspect, a century or more, and that's the problems of overproduction. So could you talk us through that dynamic of overproduction and how that factors into a farmer's decision? Well, over first of all, overproduction is always better than underproduction because you have some things to do. The other thing is that you have to have overproduction to make the secondary industries work. The chicken feeder, the, the Kellogg's uh, Corn Flakes guy, the ADMs, the Cargills, the, the things that people that ship things overseas. So uh, the problem with agriculture is you can't predict at the beginning of the year what you're going to have at the end. And so I would say that government policy is always to produce enough. Now what's enough? Well, enough usually is price depressing. And if you go back to prior to 206, we had a lot of price depressing years. And we had something called, uh, what is it, LDPs, uh, uh, deficiency payments, loan deficiency payments, where if the price of corn got less than, say, $2, and it was selling for $1.30, you got a loan deficiency payment of, say, 60, 70 cents to make up. From the federal government. From the federal government. And a lot of people say, well, that's just, that's just baloney. We shouldn't have anything like that. Well, the real question is that you can't afford to not pay somebody for their risk. If you don't pay them for the risk, then what happens? Well, they either seek something else to do or they somehow try and compensate. But let's say I've got a farm of any acre you want to tell me, and I decided that, hey, if we produce 20% less, the price will go up. So I produce 20% less. Well, everybody else produced the same amount of amount, so I just got 20% <laughs> less to sell. And so the, the government payments are essentially to impose on the whole community something that is perceived to be more fair than that. So when we limited production, acreage reserves, and we still have the conservation reserve program, the acreage reserve programs were everybody had to take out 10%, 20%, something like this, to kind of get production in sync. But well, was the government paying them to take that acreage out? Uh, in some cases, they probably had some payment on those, but it wasn't a loan deficiency payment at that time. It was a set-aside payment. Okay. Uh, now... What has really happened in the ethanol area, and I wrote a paper on demand enhancement instead of supply control way back in the, we did that study in the early 80s, or late 80s. And uh, what's really happened is the farmers in, I'd say, uh, western Iowa, southwest Minnesota, eastern South Dakota, Nebraska, particularly eastern Nebraska, and more than that, uh, say, hey, you know, the basis that we have between the Chicago price and the price we can get locally is 15, 20 cents a bushel uh, different than it is for somebody who can put water, uh, you know, put corn on a boat in Havana, Illinois, or someplace like this, where maybe the basis is 5 cents or 10 cents. Now, it's more than that today, but it, at that time, uh, they might have 5 cents basis, and the guy in Western Iowa's got a 25, 30 percent basis. That's the difference. That's the local price versus the Chicago price. Well, they started feeding cattle because they could ship the cattle cheaper than they could ship all the corn. And they did, they, they've historically done that. And they basically said, hey, you know, we can make ethanol, and that's going to increase the demand. And maybe we can demand enhance this crop instead of supply control it. And so the ethanol industry really had its foundations in, oh, it started in probably the early 80s. ADM was a big player. And uh, then and we built these local co-op type arrangements mm -hmm. where farmers took equity stakes in the, in the plant and promised to deliver a certain quantity of corn in the process. Or they could had a, a guaranteed amount that they could deliver. And so uh, the demand enhancing of corn then took place, and the energy price took off, 
And uh, all of a sudden, those ethanol plants were very, very profitable. Now, that's changed. The energy price has gone down, uh, particularly in the last couple of months. And the ethanol price has gone down, the corn price has gone down, and things like this. So now it's harder mm -hmm. to make money on an ethanol plant than it was earlier. But anyway, this whole idea of balancing supply and demand, when you have to be planned on nature and rainfall and things like this, you don't have an irrigated crop, you have a dry land crop or a naturally watered crop, they go up and down depending on whether the, it's a favorable year or an unfavorable year. And We're going to spend a lot more time this afternoon. It's, I think it's about time for us to take a break for lunch here. Okay. Um, I'm ready for that. I want to that. spend a lot more time talking about ethanol because I think that's fascinating. and You can't get more topical than the, the kind of discussion we just started Well, I'm, to get I'm into. not the total expert in ethanol, but I certainly have opinions. <laughs> but as you know, an old history teacher sitting here, Remembering the days when I would be teaching my students about the the uh, whiskey tax back in the late 1700s, and why was the government taxing whiskey, and why were people the whiskey rebellion? Why were they so upset that the government was taxing whiskey? Well, they had grain in western Pennsylvania, and they were trying to get it to markets in the east, and the best way to get it there was to distill it into whiskey. Yep, it, and it's a lot less, a lot less freight. And it's the same discussion as our discussion you just had about ethanol. Yeah, well, you see, in Brazil, one of the big problems Brazil has is hauling all that tonnage of soybean or corn to the port or to, you know, most of Brazil is in Sao Paulo and Rio and along that, that coastline. Now, it goes all the way up to Recife and places like this. But uh, they don't have the railroads or the roads that we're blessed with and it's not unusual for a farmer to spend at least one-third of the total value of the crop getting it to the market. So, uh, so they're starting to build chicken plants and these kinds of things which can eat the corn in place. They can ship a smaller amount. Mm. Uh, so uh, it, it, it repeats itself. Well, again, we have plenty more to talk about, Ed, this afternoon, but let's you and I get, a, get some lunch first. Sounds good. Thank you.